My name is Denis Geoffroy. I'm the Chief Commercialization Officer at Nano One. A uh, chemical engineer by trade, been working on batteries for 30, 30 plus years. Here today to talk about lithium iron battery. What is a lithium iron battery? A lot of components put together. I like to say it's kind of alchemistry making battery. It's a very uh, complicated thing. Put all the ingredients together, but in fact, it's really a lot of films that are rolled together, in incorporating you know, first an aluminum foil on which we would put a cathode material, the powder that's impregnated on it. Then there would be a separator. Then there would be a copper film on which we would put a graphite material. That would be the anode of it. And all of those would be put together and wound to get to a cylindrical cell, which is a standard uh, basic cells that are being used today. There are other type of cells that have been developed over the years. You know, initially it was those cylindrical cells being wound together. Today we make those pouch shells, which are same films, but which are cut and stacked together to make pouch shells. And what has been developed lately and a little bit more emphasis on bigger cells, what are called, you know, the blade cells of BYD, as an example. But it's really those films that are stuck together to make very, very big cells to get a lot of energy density. How does a lithium ion battery work? When I started my career, we we're calling them rocking chair batteries because it's really same concept as a rocking chair where the Lithium ions move from one side to the other of the battery, and the battery itself really not changing because the cathode and the anode are really insertion material, intercalation is happening in there. So the lithium ion is really moving from one side to the other. Thermodynamically, it wants to be inside the, the cathode itself, so we need to apply power, apply energy or electricity to the battery to charge the battery, so move the lithium ion to the anode side of the battery. And when we would connect that uh, eventually to a load afterward, what we would see is that lithium ion moving back through the, the cathode and the electrons moving outside of the battery and powering a car or any other application. And what's really key to the making good batteries is really having good materials at all the steps. So you need, again, to put, you know, coming back to that alchemy comment uh, earlier, to have all the ingredients really perfectly suited together to make a good battery. You'll hear it about impurities. You want to make sure you don't have any foreign materials, metals, or anything that could slightly develop aging in the batteries, create small short circuits. So the purity of those materials is very important. Cathode is the most complex, costly, and energy intensive component of the battery uh, by far. Uh, it does determine, it drives a little bit the energy density. The other elements have also impact, but it's really the, the, the key impact on the energy density, the durability, the cycle life, the power output and the efficiency of the battery. And there are different cathode active materials. You'll hear me say the word CAM sometime, but for cathode active materials. Some of those have different performances, fit different needs. First cathode material that was used in the first cells that we had back in the 90s when Sony started first lithium ion cells, they were using lithium cobalt oxide. What's been developed since then is, I would say, a mixed oxide, so a mixture of nickel, cobalt, manganese oxides that have shown more cyclability, lower cost stability. And you've also seen the family of lithium iron phosphate material that have also grown a lot lately, which have developed other advantages. NMC, or the lithium nickel manganese cobalt oxide, is really an oxide of uh, those metals with lithium in it. Advantage of that material is it has a very high density, so a lot of energy that it can fill in inside the battery, but that comes with some disadvantages, one of which is the stability of it, because when you remove all the lithium from a nickel, cobalt, manganese oxide, the oxygen is not so much tied to the materials anymore. So there is a risk that the structure of the material could break. And that's why, you know, oftentimes we don't want to charge those batteries to 100% all the time. We don't want to fast charge them too often because it can affect the structure of the material. And in some occurrences can also lead to safety issues if the oxygen really departs from the material and creates a combustion atmosphere. Atmosphere. Energy density of those materials is quite good. So that's why the first cars we see were using NMC, because that's really what allowed those expensive cars, those nice shiny toys. LFP, on the other hand, has been existing for as long as those NMCs. It's not really a new technology. I've been working on it since 2002. So it's taking its place in the market now, because what it brings is a much lower cost. The material comes 
you know, it's lithium, iron, and phosphate or phosphorus, which are much more common in the earth, in the ground as mines or as materials than nickel, manganese, or even cobalt. So for less expensive material, more easily accessible, already existing in millions of tons. And also the other big advantage of LFP is that it's not an oxide, it's a phosphate, which means that the oxygen in it has a much stronger link to the metals, the materials. So the structure of LFP is much, much stable. And it's shown, you know, you would never find a lithium, nickel, manganese, cobalt oxide on the nature. It's not a natural material. While LFP exists as trifolite, it's a rock that exists uh, in the world. You can mine it. So it's a very stable material that comes with the disadvantage, this phosphate, PO4 as a weight so it does as a downside on the density of the material so in a battery in a cell you can pack a slightly less energy with lfp than an mc but the material being more stable being much safer less additional safety measure or equipment to keep it safe it allows much bigger cells those big cells i mentioned earlier requiring less electronics around them less coolant less non-active materials which will bring at the end for a full pack the energy inside the battery much closer with lfp than it was in the past one nice way we have to show it is what we call the bookshelf analogy you can see lithium nickel manganese oxide as a bookshelf well lithium is the book the mixed metal are really the shelves themselves. So it's a very thin shelf because you don't have a lot of strength and the lithium, the books are really the ones holding the structure. When you start removing the books or the lithium, the structure will get weaker and weaker. And if you move too much of those books, your bookshelf will fall down and it will be hard to put the books back in it. So you would lose capacity. But the advantage in when it's full, your bookshelf is small. So you have a lot of energy in it. LFP on the other end has a big bookshelf. See the phosphate as itself, which stays there as a big bookshelf that has wrong structure. And you can take the books in and out of it without affecting the structure. That's really what why LFP is really much longer lasting than an MC. On cycle life, back of fast charge, and also on calendar life. So allowing cars to drive for much longer than I would be driving a car. So for hundreds of thousands of kilometers, even millions of kilometers. Everyone sees LFP as a Chinese thing. And it's true that China is 99% right now of everything LFP, making material there, making the cells there. But when you look at the history, LFP was born in the United States, University of Texas in Austin, in Dr. John Goodenough Labs, Nobel Prize of Chemistry in 99, who invented most of the cathode materials. That's where it was invented. But at the time, it was seen more as a curiosity. But at, at the same time, it was in 96, 97. At the time, Auto Quebec, the power utility here in Quebec, had a solid battery, solid state uh, lithium battery project, you know, with a lithium metal anode, a solid polymer electrolyte, and at the time using a vanadium oxide uh, cathode material. They saw the interest of LFP at the time with a lower voltage stability of the material for their technology. So they went to Texas, negotiated the, the, some of the rights, brought them back and started working on the material here at Radio Quebec and also at the University of Montreal to improve the material. And that's where carbon coating on LFP was invented. LFP by itself doesn't conduct electrons. It can get lithium ion in and out, right? But to move the electrons around, it's very bad at it. So a carbon coating is needed, a nano size carbon carbon coating on the surface. And that's what was invented in the University of Montreal and really made LFP uh, a commercial material. This was followed in Quebec at the time by a small startup, Fostec Lithium, which got the right on that IP, on those patents for the whole lithium iron market. Some other companies had the right at the time to make LFP for their own usage, but Fostec was the first one having access to those patents from University of Texas, Agro-Quebec, University of Montreal, and the French CNRS, which was involved at the time. Uh, to make LFP and open the world. At the time, you know, back in 2002, the markets for cathode material were hundreds and thousands of tons, not the millions we see today. It started slowly, but it's right here in Quebec that the first uh, plants to make LFP using those patterns were built back in 2005 for the first one and 2010 for the second one. Again, continuing my analogy as a uh, Born in Texas for LFP, but really grew in Quebec. But in parallel, you know, I think it saw the nice things happening in uh, China for it. So it went to China. China took it over where it lived teenage years, grew a, a lot. Then in 
Today, I think we can say LFP is a mature material and as a mature thing, we need to bring it back to North America. And that's what Nano One is working on, having acquired the plant that was built in 2010 that I mentioned earlier. We acquired it two years ago and we are now making it a pilot plant. Market-wise, I explained earlier why we started with NMC, because I still believe that $1,000 car initially as an EV, it was sold mostly as a third car to people. It needed to be a nice shiny thing. So we needed to make sure that it had all the power, all the, the range. So that's why NMC was the first material to be put into cars. That really made sense. And that was the same in China as it was here in the Western world. What brought LFP to really take a market share, which is now at 60 to 70%, in China and starting to grow slowly outside is really the need to make a car for everybody, to make a car that can be sold at a much lower price for people who don't need a thousand kilometers or 600 miles that they realize that they don't drive that very often in a year. So having a car that has stability, can do a lot of cycles, can be a low cost material. It's really gaining traction right now because NMC is really still for premium and there will be a place for all those technologies. It's not one or the other. There will be a mixture of all of those because there will be different needs. Like there are people buying Porsche today, there will be, and there are people buying Toyotas. So there's really a need for the different markets for the vehicles. So that's about what I wanted to cover today.